could please turn to Matthew chapter 22. technology to, to warm up here and get turned on. It's great to have Katie here today too. So. I like putting people on the spot. Is that all right? No? All right, Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 22. The title of today's message is, Whose Image? And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized the servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they had found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast them into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his cause. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God and truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Let us pray again. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Thank you so much for your word and your truth. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes, our ears, our hearts to understand what you have for us today. Use me as nothing more than a vessel and that you would be glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Pharisees tried to entangle Jesus in his teachings many times. They tried to find a reason to come up with to kill him, which was their ultimate goal. They knew they needed a reason. The only one that they ended up finding was that Jesus claimed to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, therefore declaring that he was, in fact, God. And we see in verse 15 of what we just read here that they were once again trying to entangle Jesus. This makes us have to take a look at what the message was that brought them to this plan. These teachings took place after the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, as we've talked about before. That Palm, that palm Sunday where uh, we come in teaching that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt, on a donkey, right? Signifying some prophecy being fulfilled. The first thing that Jesus did was go into the temple and drive out the money changers. What a sight this would have been. Jesus, for sure, was with a righteous anger. He flipped over tables, as we're told. John records that he made a whip of cords. Can you imagine that? A whip of cords. The religious leaders and many in the synagogue had defamed the temple and had made it for their own gain. It appeared that 
They were serving mammon over God. They were serving riches, material things. They were serving themselves over God, which is the point of the message today. And after cleansing the temple, Jesus healed the lame and the blind, and many praised him. There was a lot going on this day. Jesus went in, flipped over tables, made a, a, a cord, a whipping cord, and drove out the money changers. Then he turns around and he heals blind and lame people. And many people are praising him. This did not make the religious leaders happy at all. Jesus left. He spent the night at Bethany and then he came back the next morning. He went into the temple after eating breakfast and he began teaching with parables once again that were directly calling out the Pharisees. These parables were directly calling out these Pharisees. We had the parable of the two sons, the wicked vine dressers. Then the wedding feast that we just read about. All of these directly calling them out. You know, do you do you get it? When we read through those, when we read through that parable of the wedding feast, the wedding, and the invitations go out, and the people are like, whatever, we're not going. We don't want to go. Then they take the messengers, treat them spitefully, and they kill them. Then what happens? The message goes back out along the highways, the byways. Come to this wedding. Do you know what's being talked about? What's being talked about here is the rejection of the Messiah by the Jewish people during that time. And we see that this parable is ultimately talking about all of the murder and the, the killing that went on of Jesus, not only Jesus, but his servants, the ones he sent out to teach and to preach. This message was going out to the lost sheep of Israel. And yes, there were many saved out of the Jewish community. I mean, the apostles were Jewish. We forget to, to realize that sometimes. And that we read about many being saved in, in the book of Acts. But ultimately, the majority, the, the message was that they rejected Christ. So we see these parables calling them out directly. And this brings us to the point of the message today because in this planned entanglement, Jesus answers a question in such a way that I believe many of us have missed. I know I did. I'd never thought about it this way. And I, I, I'm not one to say, I've got a new revelation. No, I don't. I've just missed the point of what Jesus was also teaching. The Pharisees send their learners to Jesus to ask, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God and truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus knew there was wickedness in their hearts. He called them out on it. He called them hypocrites. And in verse 19, he says, show me the tax money. Let me see it. Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And I want you to get this next point. And to God, the things that are God's. Hold on to that. Put that in your brain. Write it down. Get it into you. Because we have a couple of things going on here. Jesus is showing them this denarius. And he says, whose image is on this? This belongs to Caesar. Render to him the things that are his. And to God, the things that are God's. What are those things? What do we render to God, the things that are his? And we're going to get into that. And it says, when they had heard these words, they marveled. They marveled and they left him and went on their way. Why did they marvel? Why were they astonished? Why did they look at this teaching and be like, Whoa, what just happened? Well, I believe that the message that we will look at today is the same one that they saw that day. And this is why they marveled. The denarius was a coin used as the tax money at that time. It was made of silver and it featured an image of the emperor with an inscription calling him divine. The Jews considered 
such images idolatry, forbidden by the second commandment. This was another reason why if Jesus answered yes, he would have been in trouble. His acceptance of the tax as lawful could have been seen as a rejection of the second commandment, thus casting doubt on his claim to be the son of God. With the coin displayed in front of them, Jesus said, Whose likeness and inscription is this? The Herodians and the Pharisees, stating the obvious, said Caesar's. Then Jesus brought an end to their foolish tricks. And he said, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled and went away. And when Jesus said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he was drawing a sharp distinction, I want us to get this, between two kingdoms. Two kingdoms. There's a kingdom of this world, and Caesar holds the power over over it. Now, not the Caesar of that day. Now, what I'm talking about is you think about this in a spiritual way, right? The God of this world. That's what Caesar was operating under. The system, the, the belief, the things that they practice, all of this was under the God of this world. Two kingdoms. There's a kingdom of this world and a kingdom of his world. That kingdom belongs to Christ. And in John 18, 33 through 36, it says, Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him and said, Are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning you? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. That's why Jesus was put to death. He came to deliver those from the kingdom of this world to be accepted into his kingdom, the one that is not of this world. Now, Christians, as Christians, we're part of both kingdoms, at least temporarily. Under Caesar, we have certain obligations. And I say Caesar, I mean the rulers of this world, the people in charge of us. Do we pay taxes just like they did back then? Yes, we do. Do we follow the laws of of what's going on out here? Yes, we do. We follow all those laws. We have obligations. We have all obligations that involve material things. Look at the things that we take part of. We talked about this last week, about how everything, everything is commercial. It's all commercial. And you have people uh, going against one another to be the best and the most popular. Car companies, clothes food, all of it, all of it, material things of this world. Now, because we like a certain brand of clothes or we drive a certain car, does that mean that we're not of his kingdom? No, it doesn't. Because we don't put these things above him. We don't put this kingdom that we are obligated to above him. We know that we are part of a better kingdom, a bigger kingdom, a kingdom not of this world. There are two kingdoms. There are saved and unsaved. And I know we could do this all day long with different things. But when it comes down to it, saved and unsaved, there are found and there are lost. If we're looking at it through Christian eyes, through saved eyes, through born-again believer eyes, if you belong to God, then you can look through it in these eyes. There are those for Christ and those against Christ. Now we're going to get into some scripture that proves this point. You're either for Christ or you're against him. Whether or not you believe in him, doesn't matter. Because scripture tells us that one day, every, every knee shall bow. 
and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, whether you believe in him or not. And woe to those who don't believe in him to do it first on that day. And praise God for all of us who have bowed the knee and confessed with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord before we leave this place. In Matthew 12, 22 through 30, it says, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed at this. Could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. They were saying that Jesus had his power from Satan. But Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. This is one of those teachings that we need to hold dear and close to our heart. Especially as days draw, draw worse and worse. As we get closer to what I believe are the end times. And for the last 2,000 years, it's been the end times. And we're told this in Scripture. All of the apostles called it the end times. When Jesus ascended on high, they were living in the last days. Does that mean that God is not true and what he said would come? No. He's long-suffering, like we've talked about. He's merciful, and his wish is that none should perish, but that all would come to believe in Christ. But that day is quickly approaching, I believe. And I believe many of us here see it happening around us. And for me, it gives me a, a peaceful feeling. Isn't that strange? It gives me a peaceful feeling to know that I'm secure. No matter what happens. No matter if I have to face some guillotine. You know, people joke about, well, that's, they're going to have guillotines everywhere. Well, we don't know that, but it could happen. Whether I have to face that or whether I'm raptured or whatever it is, no matter what I have to face, I know that Christ is with me. But our focus shouldn't be so much of, well, what am I going to do? Is the rapture true? Well, this person says the rapture's not true and all of this and this and that. We can get so caught up in our feuding and our fighting that we take our eyes off of Christ and we put it on our opinion, on what we want to happen, and that messes us all up. But our focus should always be on him that no matter what happens, I'm going to be fine. Because I belong to him. I am his. I have his image upon me. And that's what we're getting into. That's the heart of this today. His image is upon me. I belong to him. Just like that coin belong to Caesar. When God looks upon us, he sees us clothed in the righteousness of Christ and he knows that we belong to him. We are his. In Matthew 6, 24, it says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. If your goal in this life is to become rich and to own as many things as you can and to be uh, wealthy and to, to achieve fame and to achieve all of these accomplishments, your focus is wrong. It's wrong. Now, yes, Christians can be successful. They can have money. But it's a very 
slippery slide that you could be on if that's your focus. If you enjoy those things. Now, I, I count everything, everything beyond salvation to me is a blessing. The food, now, don't get me wrong. I take this for granted. I do it every single day. But the food I eat, the air I breathe, the car I drive, where I lay my head at night, I don't deserve those things. I'm not worthy of those things. God never promises that you will have these things. All of the riches of this world, all of these things, you will suffer persecution. Now, yes, He will feed you. He will clothe you. But look at some of the things that the apostles went through, that His disciples went through. Held in prisons, tortured, beat, left for dead. Now, that goes against a lot of preaching today. That if you're not wealthy, if you don't have fine things in life, then you don't have enough faith or you're not living how God wants you to live. Whom do you belong? Whose image is upon you? This is, question is for you. Not your child, not your wife, not your husband, not your brother or sister. I want you to ask yourself this question. Whose image is upon you? To whom do you belong? And just like that coin that Jesus asked for, and he looked at it, and Caesar's image was upon it. Whose image is upon you? To which kingdom do you belong? Which master do you serve? Because you can't serve too. Jesus was making it very clear in that teaching that if you serve this world, in the things of this world, guess what? You don't serve Him. You don't serve Him. He was making that very clear. We can go through Scripture after Scripture that points out things that signify that you do not belong to Him. It says that if you hate your brother, if you hate your brother, the love of God is not in you and you do not belong to Him. He tells us the opposite. He tells us so far the opposite that we are to love our enemies. Pray for those who persecute us. That's how we know we belong to Him. That's how we know that His image is upon us. That's why they marveled. That's why they marveled. Because they were forced to answer that question for themselves. When Jesus said, render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and render unto God the things that are God's. I must think and I must believe that a lot of them looked at that and said, who do I belong to? Do I belong to Caesar and the things of this world, the material things of this world? Do I, do I serve myself? Do I serve this world? Or do I belong to God? Do I render unto God the things that are his? I want us to ask ourselves that question this day because if your answer is, I don't know, then you need to get it right. You need to get it right. I'm telling you, the day is upon us. And it's going to be too late. If you And, and beside the fact that we're in the last hour, the last days, you don't know if you're going to walk out of here and have a heart attack, have a car crash. Whatever. People die every day. We've talked about this. We don't know. We don't know what our, when our day is. Oh, man. God forbid that anyone here, especially here listening today, would be unsure about who you belong to, whose image is written upon you. I pray to God that it is not the image of this world. Because if it is, Bible tells us you cannot serve two masters. And you may believe that you're a Christian. You may believe that because one time you said a prayer or because you do good things and all of this, but you have to know that you belong to Him. The Bible tells us that we can know that we belong to Him. That we belong to Him. Jesus had been calling out the Pharisees as wicked vine dressers evil invites sneaking into the wedding, lying sons, 
And here he confronts them to look at themselves and whose image is upon them. Jesus forced them to look at themselves, which they continually did not want to do. He did it when he taught them about lust and about murder and about all of these other things. He told them, what about adultery? Who here does not commit adultery? And I'm sure all of those Pharisees, all those religious leaders held up their hands. I follow the Ten Commandments. And Jesus says, I tell you this, if you look at someone with lust, you've committed adultery with them in your heart. And they heard that, and I bet they just, oh, they were mad. What are you talking about? Who are you to tell us this? Do you murder? Have you murdered someone? And all of those Pharisees, no, I've never murdered anybody. I keep the law. Jesus says, if you have hate in your heart, you face the same judgment as if you murdered someone. And they hear this and they're like, oh, it's no wonder. It's no wonder that they wanted to kill him because he was confronting their sin. He was confronting the need for a savior. He was showing, he was not only showing them, he was showing all of us, everyone, our need for a savior that we cannot follow the law how it's supposed to be followed. Only he could. That's why he came. He followed it. He was sinless. That's why he was the perfect sacrifice, the spotless lamb. That's why his blood is the perfect sacrifice for the remission of sins. They did not want to hear him. They didn't. They were angry. They wanted to kill him. Look at what it says in John 3, 18 through 21. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen and that they have been done in God. Now I want to ask you this. For those of, for, for those of you who, who have been born again, those of you who have been saved, do you remember the person you were before? Do you remember that person? I do. I remember who I was. I think it's good to remember back sometimes. Not to desire who I was before, but to look back and I'm blown away at how God could save or even want to save someone like me. But I want to, I want to ask you this. Have you ever thought back to who you were before you got saved and remember, that's right. That scripture is right. When I was doing those evil things, when I, when I was just giving in to my flesh serving myself, I did not want the light. I did not want that light upon me. I wanted my deeds hidden. I didn't even want to see a Bible, let alone look inside of it, because I knew what it said. I had grown up in church. I knew what was in there, and I knew it spoke out directly against the things that I was doing. His image was not upon me. I did not belong to him. The image of this world was upon me. But I can remember back, speaking clearly of what these verses mean. These men, these Pharisees, these hypocrites, and the people, and I don't want us to just get focused on these Pharisees and say, you know what, we're doing better than those guys were. No. No, we need to look at ourselves. The Bible says, says to, to examine ourselves to know if we are of the faith. We should do this every day. Take a look at your deeds. When there's something that you want to do, some plan you have or whatever, ask yourself, have I talked to God about this? Did I seek Him in prayer this morning and find out, is this what you would have for my life for this day? We're going to keep this simple because countless verses are describing the person who is marked, sealed, imaged by the world because 
There's an image upon you. If you live for this world, there's an image upon you. You want to know what I believe? And this is just my opinion. Scripture doesn't tell us this. This is just my opinion. The reason it will be so easy for most to take the mark of the beast, the mark of the Antichrist, the number of his name, is because they already bear the image of this world. The image of this world is already upon them. They already want the things of this world. So when some leader stands up or some, uh, some system arises and, and comes before the people and says, here's all of this great stuff, and if you want to continue to take part in it, you have to take the mark. You have to take the image. Listen, and it's not going to be some scary thing. It's not going to be like they're branding someone with a hot iron in some uh, warehouse somewhere. It's going to seem pretty simple, pretty easy. That's what I believe. And the people who are of this world, the people who already bear an image of this world, they will take that thing like that. And you know what makes my heart break? Is that will involve many Many who claim to be Christian, who claim to follow God, but they don't. But they don't because they've never made sure. They've never made sure that His image is upon them, that God has sealed you, that you belong to Him. In 1 John 2, 16 and 17, it says, For all that is in the world, this sums it all up, I mean, we could talk about all of the horrible things that we see going on, the shootings, the killings, the kidnappings, the rapes, the, you know, the debauchery, all of this stuff. We can sum it up in this verse, in these verses. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of this world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So how do we know we are marked? We're sealed. We belong to God. How do we know this? You know, it may be scary to hear some of this and ask yourself, man, do I belong to him? Now, I'm not, I don't want to confuse anybody today. I don't want you to doubt. I want you, if you belong to him, if you have put your trust your faith, you have bowed the knee, you have confessed Him as Lord over your life, you have accepted and believed that He came to die for your sins, to take upon Himself the wrath that was intended for us. He took it upon Himself. He shed His blood for our sin. He died upon that cross. And He rose again three days later. If you believe that, and you confess Jesus Christ with your mouth, then you belong to Him. Scripture tells us that if you do those things, you belong to Him. It also says that we do His will, as we just learned about. Who does the will of God abides forever. So how do we know what this image is? In Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, it says, In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. That is the gospel, what we just heard. That wrath was upon us. We were destined for death. We were decaying. We were dead in our trespasses. But God sent forth Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, followed the law, came to seek and save that which was lost. He died upon that cross, shed His blood, and rose again. That's the gospel. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. You are sealed. If you are a born-again believer, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. It tells us right here. Why do, we, why do we argue about this? Why do denominations and, and uh, people who claim to be Christian or whatever, 
Why do we argue about this? Scripture tells us clearly, and those of us who have been born again know, that, and we'll look at the, the, this verse later on as we close, but you know, you know that when you believed and you laid your life down and was like, I'm done, I'm done. I give it all to you. I live for you. You know at that moment, looking back, you know at that moment you were changed. You were made something new that the Holy Spirit came into you and filled your life. Sin didn't look the same. It didn't taste the same. It didn't feel the same anymore. The Holy Spirit was working in you. Giving you a desire to seek the things of God. You can look back and know that this took place. And we're promised it. It's not a feeling. Now we talk about this all the time. Do not rest on your feelings. Do not allow your feelings to determine what you believe about His promises. Because there are going to be days where you may hear this verse and be like, man, it's just hard for me to believe that right now. Because of the things I'm going through, I, I feel so far away from God. But you just remind yourself, hey, you know, I may not feel a certain way, but He promised it right here that this happened. As Carol sang that song about promises earlier, they're so important. When God promises something, it's true. It, it's true. It either has happened, it's going to happen, it's true. We can rest on His promises. Now, I took this from uh, another uh, Christian author, but it's 22 signs you are marked by God for a purpose. God is speaking to you. God is speaking to you. Now, I have this. When we pray, yes, I, I believe that God speaks to us sometimes, but I'll tell you this. It will always align with His Word. Now for me, what I believe is that the main way that God speaks to us is through His Word. Now does that not mean that God can place something specific on your heart? No, He can. He's done it with me. Does that mean that God can't give someone else a word of knowledge or uh, a word of, of wisdom to come to you and say, hey, you know, I just feel led to tell you this. But it will never, ever, ever contradict God's Word. It will not. It will not contradict His Word. You have a burning desire to follow God. Now, there will be times where you don't feel this burning of desire. But you know you have a burning desire. You have a desire to follow Him. You live to please God. You have surrendered your life to Him. You want His will in your life. Now as we go through these, I want you to ask yourself these questions. Do I really want to follow Him? Do I have a desire to live my life for Him? Have I surrendered my life to Him? And I want to do His will. You're being transformed by the power of God. Are you the same person that you were a year ago? Two years ago? Now Paul even confronts some of the Christians who remained babies and he's like, hey, what are you doing, baby Christians? It's time for you to grow up. Stop drinking the milk. Start eating the meat. That's why it's so important for us to get together. Assemble together. Read your Word. Pray together. Have Bible studies together. Talk about His Word. Sharpen one another. It's so important for us to do. You're living a life of obedience to God. You have a desire to do the things that He's called us to do. The things like we've talked about. We talk about this all the time because... I believe it's so important because if you can love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, then I think it's probably pretty safe to say that it's not going to be too hard to love everybody. It's not going to be too hard. And Scripture tells us that we don't fight against flesh and blood. 
We fight against darkness and the rulers of the wicked high places. We don't fight against flesh and blood. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, I don't care who it's to or what they did to you. Not saying that you don't have every right to be angry. Not saying that what they did wasn't wrong. But if you have unforgiveness in your heart, you're only hurting yourself. You are poisoning yourself. Not just spiritually, but physically. Doctors have come out and said that anybody who who holds hate and anger in themselves, it develops into sickness. Physical sickness. Get rid of that anger. Get rid of that unforgiveness. It doesn't mean that you have to, uh, you know, go let yourself be a doormat to whoever's hurting you. But just forgive them. Say, you know what? I'm getting rid of this thing that they did to me. I'm done with it. I give it to you, Lord. I don't want it anymore. You're walking in the light of God. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You're bearing fruit for God. Gentleness, love, peace, self-control. All of these things. You are bearing spiritual fruit for God. You're being persecuted for righteousness sake. Are you being persecuted for righteousness sake? Well, I can say that most of us here in America, we definitely don't get persecuted like they do in other countries. There are places in this world today where people are meeting together because they have a desire for God and to seek His Word and His truth that they have to go huddle and hide, hide their Bibles, hide together, to worship and to praise Him because of the fear that they may be killed. And we read these stories. We read them year after year about people coming together and and mobs of just horrible people coming and locking the doors up and setting the whole place on fire. How much more should we be doing here in America? You're living a life of holiness. You want to be holy for He is holy. Now we will never, in this life, we will not achieve perfection. You will not be good and righteous and holy upon yourself. We are only made righteous and holy and good because of Him, because of Christ. But we seek, we desire to live a life of holiness. We don't take part in horrible, wicked things. We don't go out to certain places. We don't sing or talk certain words and do all of this. We bridle our tongue. We speak life. We don't speak death and and horrible things. You're an example to others. You're impacting your generation for God. You are walking in the supernatural power of God. You have intimacy with God. You spend time with Him. You want to spend time with Him. You are led by the Spirit of God. You are filled with the joy of the Lord. And again, it could go. It could come and go. But when you think upon who you used to be and how God saved you, does that fill you with joy? It does me. That's all it takes. Is if I'm feeling down or if I feel, even if I need to correct myself, if I'm feeling a little high and mighty, I like to remind myself, hey, mister, who do you think you are apart from Christ? You better settle down. Thinking all haughty and mighty of yourself. It is only him that makes me righteous. And the last one says, you are marked by God. For a purpose. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. About individual lives. And I hope that you've been thinking upon that. That God loves you. Not just that you're a part of a big group. Now He loves His church. He loves His bride. But He also loves you individually. He loves you. He wants you. You. He wants to use you for His will, His purpose. He wants to use you. And you know, you know that He's using you. You know that you're where you're at for a purpose. Listen, I'll just say this. 
And I don't think you think about it enough, because I don't, that you being part of this congregation, that's part of God's purpose for your life. Because guess what? Us as a group of believers coming together to worship Him, we edify one another. We love one another. We lean on one another. We lift each other up. All of us here. You're here for a purpose. Because God wants to use you here. Now, definitely He wants to use you other places too. But you are marked by God for a purpose. And you need to continually seek Him and ask Him to show you that purpose and that you're walking in that. Because you could do things that you've never imagined as we talked about. That He uses the unlikely people to do the things of His kingdom, the things for His will, His purpose. He uses unlikely people. And I'll end on this. This is how you know. This is how you know that you belong to Him. That you are marked by God. You have His seal. You have His seal. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 14-17, it says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And He died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What things have become new? All, all things have become new. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Created for His workmanship, His purpose to do the will of God, to do the things of God. That's how you know that you belong to Him. You have given your life to Him. You have surrendered your life to Him. And you believe that He is who He said He was. That He is the Messiah. That He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Sometimes I think we forget or we fail to think upon the greatness of that name, Jesus Christ. And what it means. The anointed one. The Lord saves. The Lord God Almighty saves. Anointed one. That's who Jesus Christ is. That because of that name and that character and who He is, that you no longer are dead. You no longer have to be dead for those that are lost. If you're here and you are lost, you've never given your life to Christ, you don't have to be dead. Because Scripture tells us that apart from Him, you're, you're dead. You're dead in your trespasses. But you don't have to remain there. Because He took the punishment upon Himself. For those listening, you don't have to remain dead. Scripture tells us that All who call upon the name of the Lord, and that is Jesus Christ, shall be saved. That we confess Him with our mouth. We bow our knee to Him and confess Him as Lord and Savior. We just give our lives to Him and accept that free gift that He's given. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to clean ourselves up before we come. We just come to Him. And we give our lives to Him. And just as we looked right here, He does all the cleaning. He's the one that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. 
He's the one that gives us His Holy Spirit to live within us, to abode with us. And that's when we know we belong to Him. We are marked by God. And I'll end with this question. Whose image is upon you? Whose image? Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you to thank you for your word, your truth. Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made upon that cross. Lord, without it, without him, we would still be lost. We would be destined for death. Lord, but we're so thankful that you sent him to take the place on that cross. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never put your faith in who He is and what He came to do, believing that He took the wrath upon Himself, that He, the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, took upon Himself the wrath that was set for us. And in the shedding of His blood and that death upon the cross, His forgiveness of sin. And that he, when he was placed in that tomb and rose again, he offers a new life, resurrection from the death that is upon us apart from him. If you've never placed your faith in that and just called upon the name of the Lord and said, Lord, I give it all to you, and you want to do that today, just lift up your hand. I would love to pray with you and for you. It's not a prayer that saves you. It is a heart cry to the Lord, just saying, Lord, save me. Save me. And Lord, for all of those here today, I pray that you would be with them, encourage them, and help us to know that we have your image upon us, that we belong to you. Help us to rely on your promises and not our feelings. And help us to live a life, Lord, of service to you, a life of service to others, that we go out, we love our enemies, we pray for those that persecute us, that in doing so, some of them might be saved. That we love the lost, we love those who are down and out, those who are hurting, Lord, those who are hurting and in need. Lord, that we serve them, we provide for them, we lift them up. Help us to be a church that goes out and does the work because we have a desire to do it. Not that we do it because it saves us, but because we're saved, we want to go out and do it. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Keep us safe as we leave here today. We love you and we give you thanks in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. Well, I forgot to put the bake cell sign up, so don't forget the bake cell out there. And I don't see Art in the back anymore, so you better run out there quick. So let's get going before he takes it all. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be. Earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. As we forgive those who trespass against us, lead us not into temptation. 